In order for this video to make sense, you're going to need to know a little bit about the Ruby language. If you don't know anything yet, pause this video, go to tryruby.org, go through that tutorial, and then come back and start the video. So in this first episode, we're going to be deep in the crud. We're going to be talking about crud. Now, bear with me if you're an expert in, you know, some of these languages and some of these concepts. Um, we'll get to the advanced stuff soon enough, but we need to make sure everyone's on the same page. So, we're going to be creating Twitter for Zombies. That's our application. If you don't know why, go back to the front page and watch the intro. But let's jump into it for now. So, here we have our first database table. It kind of looks like a spreadsheet. We're calling it Tweets. It has four rows and it has three columns. Now we might put a label on each of these columns. The first one is the ID, the second one is status, and the third one represents the zombie, like Ash, Bob, Jim. These are our zombies. Now our first zombie challenge is going to be to retrieve a hash of the tweet with ID equals three. Now I'm not going to show you the solution. What I'm going to show you first is the result, what we want to get back from the database. In this case, we want to get back a hash which looks like this. Now you should be familiar with what a hash is, but here's a small recap. So if we do puts b status, we're going to get back I just ate some delicious brains. If we do puts b zombie, we're going to get back Jim. And if we do this at the bottom, we're going to get back Jim said I ate some delicious brains because you know, zombies love eating the brains. Now let's get back to our database table and our challenge. So there's our challenge again. Now I'm going to show you the actual solution, the code that we want to write. We want to write t equals tweet dot find three. So what that's going to do is get us back that hash and we can then do puts dot t id gets us three, puts t status gets I just ate some delicious brains, and puts t zombie gets us back Jim. Now there's another way we can write this in Rails. Instead of puts t id, we can do puts t dot id, puts t status, we can have puts t dot status, and so on and so forth. So we can use these to find our solution instead of using the hash keys. Here's what our answer might look like with those pieces of code. There's one Rails convention here that I want you to notice. Notice we have capital T in tweets in the code solution, and what's happening on the back end here is that it's going to lowercase that pluralize it, and then it's looking for a table called tweets in our database. It's time to jump in to the CRUD. And by CRUD, I mean create, read, update, and delete. Now let's figure out how we can do each of these inside our Rails application. First, in the create, we do tweet.new. We can then set the status and call t.save to save the item. For reading, we then do tweet.find3, just like you saw a moment ago. For updating, we're going to find the tweet, then we can set the values on it and save it. And then for delete, we can find the tweet and call t.destroy to delete it out of the database. Now we're going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail, and I'm going to show you some alternate syntaxes. But first with create, notice that we're not setting the ID on the object here. That's because Rails is going to take care of that for us and properly increment the ID and store that in the database. Another way we can create a new tweet is simply by sending in a hash of the items that we want to set. We can then save that. We can also write this all in one line by calling tweet.create. So that's going to set these attributes and save the object. Next up, for reading, there's lots of ways we can read data out of the database. We can find a particular item with an ID number. We can find a bunch of items and it will return an array. We can find the first one. We can find the last one. We can find all of them. We can count them. And the interesting thing about count here is that it's actually doing this the correct way. It's not going to the database, pulling everything out, and then counting it. It's actually going to be doing a count query on the database and returning that number. We can also get all the zombies and order them by the zombie name. We can limit the number to 10. We can say get us all the zombies where the zombie name equals Ash. Or we can put all these different methods together to do something we like to call method chaining. Next up we have update. So you remember with update we find the tweet, we set something, and then we save it. Alternatively, we can set the attributes value and send in the hash. 
and then save it. We can also call t.updateAttributes, which not only will set the items, but it will also save it. Next up is destroy, because zombies like destroying things, especially brains. Um, so as you saw before, we can find an item and destroy it. We can also write this on a single line. And lastly, if you want to destroy all the tweets, we can just call tweet.destroyall. So we've already reached Zombie Lab 1. This is where you get to start coding and implement some of the stuff we've already learned. So go and have some fun with your new zombie friends. Welcome to Rails for Zombies 2 Level 1. In this episode, we're going to be going over some of the things we left out in the first set of Rails for Zombies videos, covering things like creating a Rails app, the command line, database migrations, the Ruby 1.9 hash syntax, as well as a little bit of bundler and database configuration. If you haven't yet, I highly recommend you get Rails installed in your laptop or in your computer, whatever you're using, so that you can run some commands and follow along as we teach them. I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty details of installing Rails on every platform. I'm just going to mention that if you're on Windows and you don't have it installed yet, head over to railsinstaller.org. There's instructions there, a downloader. You'll be up and running in no time. If, however, you're running OS X or Linux, I highly recommend going over to railstutorial.org and just going through the first chapter. It'll get everything installed for you. You'll even get an application deployed on Heroku. So once you have Rails installed, if you run Rails from any particular directory that's not a Rails app, it's going to give you the syntax on how to create a Rails app with a bunch of different options. You can skip active record, specify what database you want to use, specify what JavaScript framework you want to use, a couple runtime options, and then finally it'll give you an example of how to create the Rails app. Let's go ahead and create our first Rails app by running Rails new Twitter for zombies. When we run that command, it's going to create a bunch of files for us in a bunch of directories. Some of these directories should look familiar from Rails or Zombies 1, like your controllers, models, and views directory. At the end, it's going to run bundle install. What bundle install is going to do is go out to the internet and download any external dependencies that your Rails application depends on. You don't need to worry about this too much. We'll come back around and talk about bundler later. So we've created our Rails app. Now let's jump into the directory. So we're going to cd into the directory. And if we run Rails from inside the directory, we're going to be given a list of commands that we can run on a Rails app, starting with the generate command to generate some new code, the console command, which we'll use to debug a little bit later, the server command, of course, to start our local development server, and the db console command to jump into a console for our database. If we want more information about any of these commands, we can run them with the dash "-h", option. But first things first, let's get our development server running. So we're going to run Rails server. It's going to give us some output, and if we go to localhost 3000 in a browser, we're going to get the Welcome to Rails screen. We can also run Rails server "-h", for more options, like if we wanted to run the server on a different port. The shortcut for this command, which you'll probably be running more often, is just Rails s. Next up, let's take a closer look at the Rails generate command. If we run it without any options, we're given a list of generators which we can use to generate some source for our Rails app. The shortcut for generate is Rails G, and let's go ahead and use that to generate a scaffold. So a scaffold, if you're not familiar, is the basic building block for most of our Rails apps. We specify a resource and it builds us a view to list out the items, edit the items, create new items, and delete the items. So here's the syntax. And we're going to go ahead and create Rails G Scaffold Zombie, because we want to create zombies. We're going to give it a name, which is a string, a bio, which is a text type, and an age, which is an integer. When I say types, I'm referring to database types. And here's a list of all the other database types which we might find useful here. When we generate a scaffold, it's going to create a bunch of files for us. Let's take a look at a few. You can see here it's generating a migration for us, the zombie model, it's going to add resources zombies to our routes.rb. It's going to create our zombies controller. 
It's also going to create our views, which should look familiar from Rails for Zombies 1. You have our index view, edit, show, and new. There are a couple other files it's going to create, like helpers, tests, and assets, and we'll see some of those later. But first, let's jump in and take a closer look at that migration. When we say migration, what we're talking about are database migrations. This is how we make changes to our database from inside Rails. And if you remember from Rails for Zombies 1, Rails is going to automatically create for us a primary key called ID. It doesn't even show that in the migration, it's just sort of assumed that every table is going to have a primary key of ID. The last thing you'll see in this migration is this t.timestamps. This t.timestamps line is the same as saying date time created at and date time updated at. These are magical fields in Rails. They get populated for you automatically and you can use them in your views. When a model is created, the created at gets set and every time it's updated, that updated gets set for you. To give you a better idea why migrations are so useful, here's a commercial I created back in my Rails Envy days. Hi. I'm Ruby on Rails. And I'm PHP. So what you got there? Oh, these are a bunch of SQL files all the developers on the team sent out. And um, I'm really frustrated because they just overwrote all my database changes. Oh, man. That sucks. Yeah, you feel my pain, right? Well, actually, Ruby on Rails uses something called migrations. This allows developers to make database changes independently without stepping on anybody's toes. You still have to write tons of SQL, though, right? Well, no. Migrations actually use Ruby, so it's database independent. Wow, that sounds really good. I think I'll give that a try, actually. You know what? On my way home from work tonight, I'll stop by Toys R Us and pick one of those up. While I'm there, I'll get Barbie to give me a ride in her pink Cadillac all the way to your offices in the land of make-believe, where you can help us finish up my application and we'll all live happily ever after. So database migrations are how we version our database, keep track of changes, so we don't have to send around SQL scripts and end up stepping on each other's toes. So back in our Rails app, we have this migration. If we start up the server at this point, uh-oh, we're going to get an error. It's not going to work. Um, it gives us an error. It gives us the line of code where there's an error. If we looked at that line of code, we would see zombies equals zombie all. Oh, so it's querying for the zombies table, but it's not yet in the database. Ah, well, we forgot to run that migration file. To run migration files, we run rake db migrate. Not only is that going to run our current migration, but if there's any other migrations that other people in our project committed, it's also going to run all of those. Here's the output we would see from our migration, and if we run our Rails server again, now if we go to slash zombies, we can get a list of the zombies and start creating them. Now that we have a zombie table and a zombie model, let's jump into the console and play around with it. So we use the console to debug our application. So we can go in here and just start running Rails commands. So here you can see I'm running zombie create name Eric Alum age 27. That's going to actually show us the SQL that's going to be running inside of our Rails app, and it's going to give us back the zombie object it created. Now remember, when you use tryruby.org, everything in Ruby has a return value. That's that hash rocket symbol you see right up there. You can see that this command returns an instance of the zombie. We can then run zombie first to get back the first zombie, which in case is the zombie we just created. We can change the name of the zombie. And then finally, we can save the zombie. It's going to show us the SQL that it uses to do that. And it's going to return true because it successfully saved the zombie. Now you may have noticed, when we created this zombie Eric here, that we used a slightly different syntax. We actually used a different hash syntax. Remember, a hash is a collection of key value pairs. And a key can be almost anything. A key can be a string. Here's the old syntax with the hash rocket. A key can be a number. A key can more commonly be a symbol. You'll notice all of these different syntaxes I showed you here are compatible with both Ruby 1.8 and 1.9. And if we're using Ruby 1.9, this last hash can also be written as name colon. It's a little bit of a shorter syntax, two less characters, and throughout this entire tutorial, we're going to be using this new Ruby 1.9 syntax. If you're just getting into Rails now, you should be using Ruby 1.9. Don't even bother with Ruby 1.8, just use Ruby 1.9, and then you'll get access to this hash syntax you see here as well. So here again is the code to create zombie Eric using the Ruby 1.9 hash syntax. Um, and here it is using the Ruby 1.8 syntax. But really, it's not Ruby 1.8 syntax. You can still use 
the same syntax, this sort of old hash syntax, in either Ruby 1.8 or 1.9. It's up to you which one you like better. You can use either, but in this tutorial, like I said, we're going to use the new way. If you take a look inside the controller that the scaffolding created for us, you can see that in the respond to block over here, it says render JSON zombies. That's using the Ruby 1.9 hash syntax. And it does the same thing as the old syntax. So we have our zombie table, but we want to make some changes to the database. How do we do that? Well, we do that by generating a migration. We're going to call our migration add email and rotting to zombies. We're going to specify the columns we want to add, in this case, the email column, which is a string, and rotting, which is a Boolean. When we want to add a migration that adds columns, we can use this title format and it'll write all the code for us. So we say add anything to and then the table name. We have our column names and our types, and that's going to generate a migration for us, which looks a little bit like this. As you can see here, it's adding two columns to our zombies table, an email column, and a rotting column. But what happens when we want to add some table options, some column options? For a default, we can just write default false. A couple other migration options here besides default. We can also add a limit, specify that it can or can't be null. We can specify which position in the table to put the column, as well as add a unique constraint to ensure that this column is always unique at the database level. Now that we have a migration, we need to run rakeDB migrate to add those columns to our database. RakeDB migrate is not only going to run our new migration, but if I checked out somebody else's migrations, it's going to run those too. Some other rake commands you need to be familiar with start with rakeDB rollback. What rakeDB rollback is going to do is look at our most recent migration and undo it at the database level. It's going to roll it back. This can be really useful if, let's say, I haven't committed my migration yet and I want to make some changes and then migrate again. It also is really useful when you think about deployment. If I deploy my application, I run a migration, and whoops, I didn't want to run that, something went wrong, I can quickly type rake db rollback, it'll roll back the migration, and I can make any changes that I need to from there. Another useful rake command is rake db schema dump, and this gets run automatically every time we run rake db migrate. See, after you have a Rails app that's lived for three or four years, um, you have a lot, end up with a lot of migrations. I mean, like, you know, over a hundred migrations. And it's unrealistic for somebody new who checks out your Rails app, you know, a new developer, to have to run all those migrations. What you find is that migrations start to get brittle after a while. This is why we have a schema.rb, and it looks something like this. As you can see here, it has our entire database structure. So the next time you check out somebody's Rails app and you need to get up and running and create the database, what you're going to run is rake db setup. That's going to create the database if it doesn't exist yet. It's going to run the schema and create the database using that schema file. And then it's going to run any seed data which you need in there. So we know how to add columns to our database, but how do we remove them? Well, let's go ahead and generate another migration for that. We'll call it remove age from zombies. The column we want to remove is the age column, which is an integer. And we are using another pattern here with the migration name, remove something from table name. That's going to generate a migration for us. It's going to obviously have the remove column command. But if you look at that remove column command, you'll notice it doesn't have enough information in it to roll it back. Sure, we can remove the column, but when we want to add it back, well, what type was it? So in this case, we also need to have an add column command in here. Now remember in the previous migrations, we had a change method. Instead of a change method, we're going to have an up method to migrate up and a down method so that our application knows what to do if we need to roll this migration back. A couple other migration commands include rename column, rename table, drop table, change column, and change column default. So we know how to add columns, we know how to remove columns. What about everything else? Well, for everything else, we're simply going to create a migration and name it anything that we want. So in this case, let's drop the zombies table altogether. Um, that's going to generate a up and down method for us, and we're going to have to write it. You can see here I've written it for us. We have a drop table in the up, and we have create table in the down. For more information on database migrations, 
head over to guides.rubyonrails.org. Over there, there's a Rails database migrations guide, which has tons of great information about migrations. So when we created our Rails app, it ran bundle install and installed a bunch of external dependencies. How did it know which dependencies to install? Well, that came from the gem file, which is at the root of our directory. So here you can see a listing of all of our Rails app's external dependencies. And whenever we want to make sure we have these installed or go out and install new ones, we can just run bundle install. And remember, that got called by default when we created our first Rails app. For more information on Bundler, obviously I don't have time to go into all the nitty gritty. Head over to rubyonrails.org in the screencast section there. You'll find a screencast in Bundler I created. Also, you can go straight over to the Bundler website at gembundler.com. By default, our Rails application uses a SQLite database. One way we can tell this is on the previous slide where we saw our gem dependencies, it had listed gem SQLite 3, so it's using a SQLite database. But how is our database configured? Well, that happens in our config database YAML. Let's take a look inside. Here you can see we have a configuration for our development, test, and production environments. How might we change this out for MySQL? Well, we simply would have to change this configuration. We'd give it the MySQL adapter, the database name, the username and password for our database, and we would replace the SQLite driver with MySQL2 inside of our gem file, run bundle install, and then we'd be using MySQL. That's all we're covering for level one. Now it's your turn to take this information and learn by doing in the challenges.